So I'm going to talk to you about psychopathic traits and how they might reveal um, particular problem behaviors. Um, when I was asked to do this talk by the TEDx team, they told me we're going to be doing a theme called Patterns and Symmetry. It made me think about paintings and patterns and paintings, and I immediately thought about, um, it's silly, but the movie Clueless, um, 90s teen movie where Alicia Silverstone um, says something about Monet, about from far away it's okay, but up close it's a big old mess. And I thought, okay, I'll send them a draft and I'll say something, I'm going to talk about Monet and patterns and I'm going to relate it to my research. And then I was like, I can change it later. And then they shared it on Facebook and said, Luna's going to be talking about um, Monet and comparing it to psychopathic traits. And I was like, OK, I'm committed to that. So hopefully I've made my talk a little bit more clever rather than clueless for you, but we shall see. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about um, Monet paintings and kind of relate it to my research. So if you look at a Monet painting, for example, or an impressionistic painting, you can see that there are patterns in it, and the paintings and colors look quite uniform from far away. When you zoom up close, you can see that the pattern really breaks down, and you start to see individual dots, and you find some lonely dots. So for example, there's some blue dots within this beige uniform color, and up here you can see there's some purple dots in the blue, um, and so these little lonely dots really enrich the overall quality of the painting. But they are few colors, so you can see there's just a few blue ones in here, but they're quite distinct in the pattern. And actually, I study antisocial behavior and problem behaviors in, in children, as I said. And I got this um, picture from Daily Mail article, and they were talking about how the painting had been slashed by drunks who were I guess, out in a museum, as you do. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I thought this was quite apropos because of my study on antisocial behavior. Now, of course, this would have been very costly to repair. And in the same way, we know that uh, conduct problem behaviors and antisocial behaviors in young children are also very costly, not only in terms of juvenile justice costs, but also lost educational and job opportunities for young people who persistently or get into trouble, but also the cost of possibly taking children out of their home and into care if the parents cannot control their behavior. So these problem behaviors are quite costly and something to pay attention to. Now, when we think about children who show conduct problem behaviors, we might think that they're all pretty much the same and that they show uniform kind of behaviors, same kind of motivation for their behaviors, same kind of personality characteristics and features might underlie these conduct problem behaviors when you look at it from far away. However, if you zoom up close, we know that not all of them are the same. Some of them are quite unique. They're the few um, amongst the larger array of uniformly colored um, patterns. And I'm interested in these uh, few kind of um, individuals. So luckily, these are the few, but they show a persistent problem behavior that's more aggressive and tend to not feel bad when they do things wrong and just don't have a conscience for having done um, bad behavior. In my early work, I found that there were children, again, few, that were, remained cool and kind of um, not bothered when they performed an aggression task where they were pl uh, playing and competing against an, a fake opponent. Um, so I had them do this task in my research. Okay, so you would hear something like, I'm gonna do a male voice. <laughs> Man, you're so slow, my grandma could beat you. That's gonna cost you 100 points. So <laughs> when you hear a provocation message like that, um, especially when you're playing this competitive game. Your heart might go um, beat faster, you might sweat from your palms, you might experience anger and kind of hot-headedness about it. Um, so those are normal reactions that most of us might feel. In my research, I found that there were some who stayed kind of cool as a cucumber um, at the same time that they were really aggressive, so their hearts didn't really react, their sweating really didn't go up. And again, these were um, a few individuals within the larger um, uh, population of people that had pro problem behaviors. They also tended to show particular characteristics. So in terms of psychopathic traits, they were less uh, 
caring about the feelings of other people, less caring about other people's values. They didn't have empathy for other people and couldn't kind of share in other people's emotional expressions. So, you know, these psychopathic traits tended to kind of um, delineate a certain kind of individual. These were the few amongst the uniform. And I'm going to argue that, again, these are distinct um, individuals that show a particular pattern of behavior. So um, those with, um, what I did was to survey individuals um, at initial time point, and those that had initially high conduct problem behaviors shown in the black line, I followed them over time to see how their behaviors developed. And you can see that at time two, I mean, uh, two years later, they're you know, much higher than those who initially started with low conduct problem behaviors. But there's um, a pattern here, or a distinctiveness based on psychopathic traits. Those that had high conduct problem behaviors and high psychopathic-like traits at the initial survey were actually much higher than all the other individuals. And this is compared to those who ha initially had the same level of conduct problem behaviors at the initial survey, but who were low in psychopathic-like traits. So they're increasing in their conduct problem behaviors over time at an enormous rate. And this is contrasted from those who initially started low. And you can see there's some there that had you know, high psychopathic-like traits. So High psychopathy is not always related to problem behaviors, although I would expect them to still be quite hurtful um, interpersonally. So these are, this was only revealed when you look closer at the pattern of problem behaviors. So looking closer at the picture revealed this um, distinctiveness of those. Now one thing in my field of, of research that we know is that the juxtaposition of um, you know, people and their environments is also important. So the thought is that being a bad child is because you're with a bad parent, for example. So we know that targeting and showing parents how to respond better to child problem behaviors is an effective way to affect change in that problem behavior um, over time. So targeting the parent, we know that it changes the parent's behavior. So in that way, we think that perhaps the parent is a cause of the problem behavior. If we change the parent, the, chi the child changes, perhaps the parent was the cause after all. So that juxtaposition of a child with a particular parent may be quite important. The environment in which the child is growing up may be very important in terms of the influence on that child. So that led us to kind of look at clinical populations of kids to kind of understand where their problem behaviors come from. And again, we know that, or we think that, parents' behavior is a huge contributing factor to the problem behaviors in those kids. But there was a really cool study done where they took children with problem behaviors, these were children with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and they gave them to other parents, parents of children who didn't have problem behaviors. Now, it was only temporary, it wasn't like forever, but they gave them to these new parents. And so really that juxtaposition of having a new parent with that problem behavior child should yield good behavior from that child. Actually, what happened was the parents tended to respond negatively to that child's problem behavior. So the old adage, you know, you're driving me crazy, could actually hold water. Actually, the juxtaposition could work the other way. So it could be one way is that the parents' um, problem behaviors or the parents' problem parenting is maybe an action that is causing the child's problem behavior. But we could actually think of it as a reaction as well. So it could be that the poor parenting that we see from parents is actually a reaction to the child's problem behavior. And this is not an entirely new idea. We do know from influential research that when you have kind of a, we'll call this one, I called the other one a cool one, so we'll call this one kind of the hot child, we know that Children who kind of push parents' buttons and push the boundaries of what they can get away with and have tantruming and, um, you know, whining and crying, that parents sometimes respond in kind or sometimes parents back away from kind of uh, controlling that problematic child because it becomes so difficult. 
And over time, this process could unfold with the child pushing further and further. Maybe the second time, the parent tries to hold their ground. But with this escalation of problem behaviors from the child, from tantruming, the child learns, if I push just that bit further, my parent will back down and I'll get what I want. And I'm not saying that the child is doing this consciously and that they're trying to manipulate the situation. It's just learning that we all do. When we have a payout, for example, we would um, reenact that behavior over and over again to get that payout, to get what we want. And so this is a coercive process that is happening bi-directionally. There's a reciprocal process going on between the parent and child that is leading to this behavior. I mean, think about if you take a child to a supermarket, for example, and they want some toy or they want chocolate, and they start you know, crawling on the floor, crying and tantruming and screaming, and you have other parents watching you. For a parent, it's really uncomfortable to not want to give in to that situation. And a child then learns, if I just push those boundaries, especially when it's on public display, I might get what I want. So there might be some children that are particularly attuned to the rewarding aspects of their problem behaviors. So they're aware of that pay payout and they kind of live for it. And these are children that, again, I argue are more cool and more kind of callous the way that they use other people who don't feel for other people and lack emotional depth. We call these callous and unemotional traits. They're part of the psychopathic trait dimension. Callous and emotional traits have now been added to diagnostic criteria of clinical disorders from the American Psychiatric Association that mental health workers use. And what we know is that children with callous and emotional traits don't respond as much to parents' behaviors. And in that way, we almost think of them as being resilient. Now, usually resilience is a good thing. You know, you're resilient to, kind of resistant to bacteria, resilient to, you know, kind of uh, stressful life events. But actually, these children might be more resilient in that they're not affected by their environment, which could be a negative thing. For the hot child, what we know is that um, the things that influence their problematic behavior are things like not being able to communicate effectively with other people, lack, lacking in intellectual functioning or reasoning ability. We also know that it's related to, their problem behaviors might be related to um, poor parenting, being too harsh or being too lax in your parenting. But also their problem behaviors might result from, you know, hanging around bad peers, for example. In contrast, the child who is more cool is actually more calculated in their behavior. And so their problem behaviors, as I've shown in um, previous work of mine, is not related to poor intellectual functioning. They're pretty normal in intellectual functioning. They're able to reason quite well. They're able to communicate well. Um, their poor behaviors, recent research shows, is probably not related to hanging out with bad peers. So possibly it's motivated from their own kind of personality. And like I suggested, their problem behaviors, those who are high in callous and emotional traits are shown in the blue line, they're probably not related to poor parenting. So their conduct problem behaviors are not linked up to poor parenting, whereas the hot ones are. You can see that more effectively here. You have parenting inefficiency as being related to, as parenting inefficiency goes up, you can see conduct problem behaviors go up. That's for your low callous and emotional um, child. For the high callous and emotional child, they're high regardless of what their parents' parenting is like. Now this is one time point I should point out. But, so what this would suggest is that perhaps Children with callous and emotional traits don't change their spots based on their environment. This juxtaposition works the other way, possibly. And I argue one thing that we hadn't really considered from all the prior research is whether um, instead of being um, affected by their environment, perhaps children with callous and emotional traits are changing their environment. So we could actually swap these around. So perhaps they're creating an environment in which their problem behaviors are just simpler to get away with. So I follow children and their parents over time and survey them about every year since I'm looking at problem behaviors that are relatively infrequent. 
And I try to get the child's perspective and the parent's perspective in order to understand the dynamics unfolding within those relationships. And what I find, consistent with what I've been talking about, is that for those with low callous unemotional traits, the more that their parents are distressed, the more these children increase in their problem behaviors over time. So their parents' distress and feeling inefficient with their parenting is causing their problem behaviors to go up over time. For those with high callous unemotional traits, we don't find that. So for them, we actually find that the more that they engage in problem behaviors or have more conduct problems, parents tended to become more distressed over time based on those problem behaviors. Parents also became more erratic and less stable in their control. So, you know, setting limits and having curfews and things like this, they tended to be more erratic if they had a child with callous unemotional traits. And lastly, if these children showed severe problem behavior, so if they had delinquent behavior, their parents even more reduced in their control or backed off in terms of the control. So these children seem to be more resilient to those um, parenting strategies. And they're also creating an environment in which their behavior might be more um, less controlled, and so they're able to engage in problem behaviors over time because their environment is changing to suit that problem behavior. Again, I'm not arguing that this is conscious on their part, it's just that everything's creating a perfect storm for creating bad behavior because people are backing off from them because they don't seem to respond to punishment, for example. So in that way, instead of it being an action in the case of children who have callous and emotional traits, it's more of a reaction. Parents are reacting to the behavior. And one thing that was really interesting to me is that not only are parents aware of the conduct problem behaviors and kind of reacting to them, they're actually reacting to the way in which those problem behaviors are evidenced without remorse. So one way that we can change, even though parents aren't, may not be the cause of problem behaviors, we can definitely make them a part of the process to eliminate problem behaviors. So it could be that focusing on the emotional connection early on could diffuse the effects of callous and emotional traits. Work in my lab and others shows that parental warmth, for example, is one way to diffuse the effects of callous and emotional traits. Another way is to talk to children about thoughts and feelings early on. And what we know is that, you know, think about the painting, any, any mistakes or inadvertent, br inadvertent brush strokes within that painting are fixed simpler early on rather than later when the pattern might become too complex to 